And I mean, like just before we, just before I press press record there, um, I was asking AJ about you know his clients that he's taking stage next year, and this is you know we're, we're at Christmas now, and this is always a time when oh, people are finishing no up seasons, but they're also thinking about Canadian planning Wi-Fi. for the season ahead. And AJ, when it does come to you know getting clients on board with yourself and looking ahead to prep like next year, for, say for example. What are the things you're kind of considering with like the first time competitor before you, you know, agree to kind of take them through that process? Sure. So I think with, I mean, first and foremost, like, thank you guys for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. So yeah, I think with, with regards to sort of first time competitors, uh, one of the, the, the major things is, is kind of building up an understanding of, of this individual's diet, training, uh, stress, lifestyle tolerance so understanding all of those metrics is, is something that i'd like to do over the course of ideally working with them in an off-season period because in an off-season you get all of those things you get understanding training tolerance so like what volumes can they recover from typically when do they deload what are their signs of deloading how do we manage fatigue for this individual etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, we get an understanding of their lifestyle, you know, what do they do for a job? How does that impact their training? What does their week to week look like? Uh, what are some things that we run into as obstacles for those moments of time when stress is high and how do we tolerate that? And then we also get to run through like mini diets, for example. So whether it be a pre prep diet, a mini cut or, you know, whatever, it, whatever it may be, we get to understand, okay, how do we instigate fat loss with this individual? You know, what's it look like? What's their response? Uh, how metabolically adaptive are they? How well do they reverse from that phase? How well do they uh, adhere to the post-diet window? Do they adhere to it well? Do they go out and eat a ton of calories and gain a load of body weight really, really quickly? You know, what 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 is their tolerance, basically, to, to bodybuilding, you know, bottom line? And, you know, a, a big thing that I, I think I, I realized this very soon as my coaching career is that taking on someone that you've never worked with before you have no understanding of at all is very, very difficult to put them into a contest prep. The heart, like it's like skipping from level zero to level a hundred in coaching collaboration skill level like that. And, mm. you know, you can get some situations where you're very, very lucky and that individual is like gold dust and they, their adherence is perfect. Their lifestyle set up for bodyboarding and it's go, go, go from the start and you're fine. Great. Brilliant. But that's a once in a blue moon kind of thing. It doesn't happen often. Most people end up having to develop the skill and tolerate things during the process to be a better bodybuilder and to be able to execute a contest prep really, really well. And not just execute the prep, but also execute the time period after the, the post-show phase, the transition into the off season, which is incredibly important to set up the next window of time, but also to ensure that that individual does not do one prep and then never do a prep again or never even think about bodybuilding again because they hate it and that can often happen as well when you put someone into from zero to hero you put them through that process without an understanding of their tolerance they don't have any tolerance to anything but you keep pushing them because you've said you're going to prep this person and that's what they paid you for and then the end result is that they actually end up hating bodybuilding altogether that can actually yeah. genuinely happen so protecting that person from those things happening is, is really, really key for me. Um, I think that, you know, one of the major things in terms of like time and, and length of, of that, of that period of, 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 you know, sort of process with working so on, I think at least a, a year would be nice in most cases. So that allows you a year of understanding what the off season looks like for that person. That also allows you to probably kind of set them up and we'll talk about that maybe later in the podcast about like where we want to actually end up starting someone. It allows you to set them up in a good start point so that first prep looks like it should be successful on paper, at least from a timeline standpoint, and then you can just kind of execute it. You uh, mentioned there, AJ, kind of like about making sure people don't hate the sport. Mm. What kind of steps would you be implementing there with someone that you kind of felt like, oh, they're maybe, maybe on the cusp of falling the other way with it? I think it's pretty clear from day one. And the reason why it's clear from day one is um, because you kind of get a quite a quick understanding within the first, I say day one, I'll, I'll rephrase that, it's probably the first two months of coaching. 
you get a good understanding as to why someone's actually doing this. You know, mm. you can see, you can say, you can, you can get the tone of voice from someone. Cause often I do like audio or video check-ins with clients. So I, I get to understand like their tone of voice when they're talking about training, their description of how their week has gone, how much they are passionate about the process. And you get to understand like what, what that actually looks like for someone. And, and when you get someone that is truly passionate about the process and is really wanting to learn and is really excited to tell you about their week and check in, you're like, cool, you're probably going to love prep. And then you yeah. get some other people that are like, not really reporting much about their week, not really excited, uh, kind of posting more on Instagram than they are talking about like good stuff in their check-ins and wanting to learn. Mm. And you get the impression that they're kind of doing it for maybe the wrong reason. Um, and, or you get people that are very, very like emotionally reactive to everything that happens. So like yeah. one bad set, walk out of the gym, one bad set you know everything's game over and it's like you know this is something we need to build you we need to build your tolerance to actually handle a bad session let alone yeah. prep yeah you know imagine if you have a whole week where your scale weight doesn't go the way you want it to but you can't handle one <laughs> bad set in the gym you know that's a terrible terrible stress tolerance so working on that first would be the goal and encouraging them that if they work on that and they get better at that then actually as an athlete they're going to be able to tolerate so much more so yeah i think you learn quite quickly what you're what you're working with i suppose it's like a, a a resilience that you nearly have to embed in someone uh or at least hope to to integrate into their personality yes definitely i definitely do think that like obviously the time spent working with a coach prior is important but also just like time spent like living the kind of bodybuilder lifestyle as such like i think some people get into wanting to do a bodybuilding show thinking that it is it's just a diet like it's just i'm gonna start prep at this time and i'm gonna finish my show at this time whereas like you can stick to a diet for that long but it doesn't necessarily mean that the diet's gonna go well or that you're gonna be able to tolerate it quite well and obviously you know you have lots of skills that are gonna go along like creating like an environment where you can be quite adherent like even just something as simple as being able to sit down and like eat your meals at like regular meal intervals across the day, uh, you know, having a, a relatively healthful diet where, you know, you're not picking junk foods just to fit your macros. For example, you're prioritizing foods that are going to help you perform better, help you have more energy because like that stuff, like it depletes over the course of a prep. And like, a lot of that stuff is much easier to build when you're not focused on a deadline that's like looming and you're not stressed out about that it's much easier to do it when you have like ample resources, like in an off season. And like, that's like the time to kind of create these kind of habits that essentially when you get to prep, it's just reducing kind of what you're already doing, right? It's just like your off season meals, just decrease in size. Your step count now just slightly increases, but you already have the systems in place to make it much easier. And it's, yeah, as I said there, you can definitely tell when somebody is kind of like doing it for the right reasons or when they're doing it for the wrong reasons in the sense that, yeah the stage photos they look amazing like people look class when they're like stage lean but like it doesn't necessarily mean that like everything that led up to that point was like fucking like what's it, what's it called sun oh rain rainbows and sunshine. Rain. that's what i'm trying to think about it's, it's not always like that like <laughs> at that point right it's, it's actually probably the inverse <laughs> you have lots of days where you're sitting at home sitting in your head and like analyzing pictures and be like i look like shit um so like having that kind of degree of like passionate uh, being passionate towards the process and being passionate towards the lifestyle and then just saying hey you know what i've got physique now i've got good habits maybe i'll get on stage one day as opposed to i'm going to get on stage maybe to get status or get a few instagram likes and all this kind of stuff which you know you probably won't make it past your first bad day of prep if that's the case yeah 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 i think bodybuilding is an amazing sport for someone to just decide on going to start bodybuilding because i suppose with other sports it's kind of a okay look and i suppose but like with bodybuilding you do look you pay a membership fee you pay an entry fee but there's a lot more required than just showing up on the day to uh, compete whereas like if you're playing i don't know golf tiddlywinks powerlifting even i suppose to some degree there isn't a whole pile of lifestyle requirements to 
meet the demands of the sport. Whereas, like you were kind of saying there earlier, to have the right, you like so much in your life already has to align as regards training, stress, meal prep, being able to sleep. Do you have the the finances to eat a certain way? Uh, maybe your the your closest gym is pretty shit, so maybe you have to end up driving a half an hour to get in good training sessions. Like there is an awful lot there. Whereas if you're playing a, you decide to pick up Sunday league soccer, there's probably a club five minutes down the road, and you can probably just show up to the match. Yeah, I think where bodybuilding is kind of a a true lifestyle. It's it's it. it it is a sport and obviously you get on the stage, but it, it's a, it's a, a lifestyle, a, a lifestyle. You have to, to live yeah. through it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So this is a 24 seven thing to, for the most part. And you're right in saying that other sports are not kind of like that. You don't have to maybe give 24 seven to everything. I think 24 seven, you know, kind of applies just as you climb the ranks in other sports, you know, mm -hmm when you get to like a professional level in most other sports, you have to probably give 24 seven to it to be able to be the best. But with bodybuilding, it's like even to be decent at an amateur level, you probably need to be giving a good amount of your hours in a day to, you know, dedicate towards the, the task at hand, unless you're very genetically endowed. So yeah, um, it, it is kind of one of those things that you have to ramp up the pace or the severity of your, your decision-making processes very, very quickly. AJ's regards that do you think there is maybe some um I suppose this is where the first timer shows do our categories at least do have a merit yeah. because when now I'd like I did one bodybuilding show I'd say 11 years ago at this stage but I do think having teen classes having first timer classes it does really like as long as someone's not a complete idiot and delusional you you do see a lot of people if they are in those categories and they stand up and they do look around and they kind of go, okay, this is, this is for me and this, or maybe this isn't for me. And I think there is kind of like a thing with bodybuilding where it's not a sport that can be done, uh, done casually. And that maybe like, it's a, a case of living the lifestyle for a couple of years and building up the competency, building up the, uh the the awareness of what actually has to go into it because like you said there it is even at the lower levels of bodybuilding like like if you were to place at a local show your life is probably centered around this one sport or eating a certain way training a certain way for years to even get to that level for most people if they aren't that genetically uh predispositioned towards the sport yeah yeah i i agreed 100 I, I think that you know the only the only sort of well, it's not really a downside it's more of a plus side but the, you know the first time is in the team categories are now becoming just so much more competitive so you yeah know, you get first time as just a complete freaks um <laughs> and they're also just first timers that have just been doing this this for like you know a decade and then they rock up after doing it for a decade super consistently whether they even know it that or not just yeah. the fact that they just enjoy living the lifestyle they rock up and then they're actually you know a pro level already you know um but yeah you do you do quickly kind of find out in in, in the midst of that level of competition oh you know there's people that do this a lot more seriously than i do it or you know yeah. you, you learn that maybe genetically it's not not the option for you whatever it whatever it may be um and uh yeah you can you can obviously learn that quite quickly without jumping in crazy deep end I think that's maybe a good segue into the next uh, kind of topic we had there, which is like, is a coach necessary, I suppose, for, for someone that's getting into bodybuilding? Because you even said it there where you can have first timers that for whatever reason, maybe they're a little bit neurodivergent and they only eat chicken and rice or maybe they're, they're that way inclined. But someone can live that bodybuilder lifestyle. They can be... Uh, already at a pretty high level without ever stepping on the stage, would you kind of make an argument for or against that person getting a coach? I think for most first timers, it, it would definitely make sense to have a coach. I don't think it's essential because I think there's a lot of knowledge out there. There's a lot of information out there that you can gain yourself without having someone behind you telling you what to do each week. 
you know, for example, even now, you know, at Natural Bodybuilding Worldwide, it's a shameless plug, but there is a, a whole course section on how to take yourself through a contest prep, when to make changes, why to make changes. And I'm confident, in fact, I know that competitors have used that course to prep themselves to, you know, a great level of conditioning in place really well. So I know that, that there's things out there. It's obviously just number one, it's, it's finding them. Some people take a while to find these kind of things. And number two, it's being able to apply them without getting distracted by the noise because there is going to be a lot of, there is a lot of noise. There are so many ways to skin a cat. Um, there's probably a few different ways that if you blend this and that, it's not going to go together very well. So if you kind of are conscious enough to stick to one strategy and learn one strategy, learn it really, really well and just execute, you're probably going to do a pretty good job and learn from people that have kind of been there, done that in the natural bodybuilding realm, because there is definitely a little bit of an inherent difference between the way a contest prep might look for an assisted athlete versus and natural and the thing is for natural athletes it's become it has become a little bit harder to absorb and digest that knowledge because a lot of the new natural bodybuilders will immediately look up to ifbb professional bodybuilders and take on board what they are doing and think that they probably should do similar things and there are a lot of great ifbb professionals out there that are putting out great knowledge and great advice and that's awesome but again it might not be the the best cross transferable knowledge to a novice first time a natural athlete just wanting to you know do their first prep um it might not be even enough as well for them to take them through the, their first prep um so yeah i think a coach would also help from a psychological standpoint because there's going to be regardless of whether the course that you follow or the advice that you follow is is sound there's going to be a lot of times where you are going to second guess yourself me and shane were talking off air about you know the fact that you know a, a coach feeding back to you is is a big positive benefit of like knocking your head back on when it's fallen off and you know i I know myself because i i prep myself i prep myself since uh 2015 i did my first ever contest prep with a coach in 2014 but since 2015 i prep myself um and i wouldn't say that i have prepped myself 100 percent because i've always had someone that's kept an eye on me whether it be a close friend whether it be you know my partner or whatever it may be like to just keep my head in check and to look at my pictures from a non-critical slightly less messed up bias um which is which is always a good thing because you know you, you get contest lean and physiologically you've changed so your your perception on everything is completely skewed you you only see body fat you don't see fullness anymore you don't see you know changes in 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 physique that are maybe positive but you know if if something's not happened to your liking in that week you're only going to see the negatives so um having a coach to tell you right we're actually really good where we're at is is a very good very good benefit so you obviously do get some people who have the temperament where they can coach themselves like they can keep keep it their own way but then you like we all know athletes who you know if they do try to coach themselves or they just go about their own way of doing things they like chop and change their plan like every two weeks or something like that because i suppose prep prep is like unique in the sense that like there is something to a degree happening every week right like you ideally you're probably losing a little bit of body fat every week but you know, if you've never done it before, you can get a little bit impatient to be like, should I be losing a little bit faster or should I be losing a little bit slower? You know, when you get t- towards the point of getting t- to that stage of leanness where your body composition can change almost like daily or even like, you know, throughout the day and you're then you're having like the hunger creep in too, that's also a time when you can go against your own best interest. Like maybe I need to have another 100 grams of carbs a day or maybe I need to, you know, uh, add deadlifts back into the plan because my back is looking a little bit i don't know deflated or something like that right and like like these people exist but then there's also the people who can prep themselves fine like the the girl natalie hayes that won wmbf worlds this year she turned pro on the first day an amateur day then she won worlds the next day is a pro and she 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 self-coached herself this year and it's her, her first season which i find like amazing she was saying she used like her so books cool. to help her prep and that's like yeah. that's obviously an outlier well, right but like for the majority of people they will need to have somebody in their corner because like you will have those messed up t- thoughts as you, as you mentioned you won't be able to look at your pictures and 
see the the benefits and how it's looking like versus uh, the day before like that's one thing i looked at with my peak week pictures like like now i'd look back at my peak week pictures and i can actually see the difference between me being flat and me being full and me being spilled where like then just look crap the, the whole time you know um, <laughs> and like that's just not an objective perception that i had then it was it was completely skewed because it's just looking for the negatives and it's uh that's like one of the reasons why i would have i had a coach at the time right i knew everything i knew but having a coach there to keep me on track with the grander goal was like was super necessary for me it's probably it's super necessary for a lot of people no i suppose it's just like where similarly to like powerlifting or any other sport i do think there's a real caveat for people and aj said it there earlier where when people get into fucking bodybuilding powerlifting whatever it is we immediately go to the outliers and i suppose that's where people kind of run into issues like if it is the case that you're looking at someone you're like oh yeah no this 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 lad i'm starting to follow he's a 900 kilo total and he weighs 80, 85 kilos or he's a uh a, he's 240 pounds lean and he's in the the WMBF. it's like you're you're in the, you're you're looking at the the half a percent of the of the top but it's often the case that like we don't see but we don't position ourselves well in the bell curve i think a lot of people do think it's like no i'm elite i'm 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 that i'm that one percent rather than kind of kind of going okay look look where's that where's joe average here in the fall in the, the spectrum because like particularly with powerlifting i think like and i suppose bodybuilding it's kind of a, a a similar kind of person seems to excel in both sports that it is that kind of um it is the person that can decipher information critically analyze it and then maybe apply it to themselves like like that woman that prepped herself for that wmbf comp she is obviously an outlier but she is obviously very intuitive as well to to be able to like pick up a sport within her first season she might be she might be training a decade but to get to that level that fast there there is obviously something with it within that person that's able to do that and like shane was saying there like like for the average person you are probably going to be playing mental gymnastics with yourself for 20 30 weeks so probably is probably the best code best uh best idea to hire shane or aj if you are going to do a decide to do a prep for the most part i suppose like we know at the top level what the difference looks like between categories but when someone's fresh in they weigh like a wet 80 kilos starting their prep or a wet 70 kilos starting their prep for their first for if you are deciding on your first show and you have the choice of bodybuilding classic physique or uh phys physique mm. how would you what are the things that you would kind of push or pull people in either direction aj with deciding on an actual category because i suppose for outside of it being just preference there are obviously with muscle pination angles maybe limb lengths all of these things that will obviously factor in what classes people have the genetic predisposition for yeah for sure i, I think it obviously depends where they're at in their training career because as people grow they, they often can like grow into categories a little bit as, as they yeah. build new tissue but i think it is probably going to be pretty clear for for most most athletes in the sense that a men's physique athlete is going to be quite clearly very well developed through their top line clavicular width is going to be a big thing so you know, wide shoulders broad shoulders well developed top line symmetrical abs great ab development and a narrow waist with good lat development and maybe they've got some limitations through their lower body or their lower body is not responded quite as well as their upper body. That's not a given. Some men's physique guys have crazy legs. But a men's, a men's physique shape is like, it's just a standout shape. You, you know what it is when you see it. Um, so men's physique is going to be a pretty clear one. That's not to say that a men's physique athlete could make a good bodybuilder, but it's often that they'll get to a point where they could arguably do better in men's physique than they could do in bodybuilding because mm. of the, the way that they flow in those poses um but again it can depend on preference if they f if they can fit both and they want to be a bodybuilder go for bodybuilding if they prefer men's physique go for men's physique so it's a, a simple kind of choice there i i don't this is something that i actually feel quite strongly about i don't think you should often try and do both because i just don't think that it favors the athlete if they've got serious goals um 
I think that if you really just want to have a hack at both and you just want to do it for fun, that's cool. But I don't think if you want to, you know, do really, really well and, you know, end up succeeding in the long run, I think you should really hammer one category. So I don't think it helps the judges as well if you're competing in two different categories and they've got to first off find where they actually like you the best. And, you know, if, if you want to win one of them, you, you've got to... Yeah. You gotta kind of go all in in my opinion so I, I don't think it often favors the athlete to do multiple categories even if it is classic and bodybuilding because this is the whole thing it's like in my opinion if you're a good natural bodybuilder you're probably going to be a decent classic bodybuilder as well mm. to be fair um there's certain instances where that doesn't really match up and there's certain instances i can give a great example this year um you know jack hinsley cloth he is a perfect natural classic bodybuilder he is really 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 good in the classic poses and his presentation is classic everything his hair his look his you know his transitions between poses everything is classic so he's a great example however there's a lot of classic bodybuilders that are are good but they could also just be good bodybuilders um and it's clear clear as day again most of that in my opinion because jack when you when he was younger, he was a, an amazing junior bodybuilder when he last competed. It was very he competed in the same year as me when I competed as a junior, and he was one of those that I thought he was you know very you know, very good. Um, so uh, he, he could do bodybuilding if he wanted to, but the main thing is that his like his thing is his the posing, the way he presents himself, the flow, everything about that is classic. So. It, it kind of f- favors him to go that side. So I think classic is more about, okay, like, you know, rib, ca- rib cage dimensions makes a difference, you know, pec fullness. But then again, Jack hasn't got crazy pecs. Um, front double, if the front double looks and flows like a classic physique, it's like front double side chest, those kind of poses. If they stand out as like a classic look, then, you know, someone maybe could go down that path. Um, but again, if they, if they prefer just to do bodybuilding, then do bodybuilding. Um, again, you know, Adam literally proved my point on that front. Adam Powell, when he did the Olympia, he won both the classic and the, the open bodybuilding. And he was just as just as good in, in both. I don't think he's a, cla- in my opinion, he's not a classic bodybuilder. I don't think he should pursue classic bodybuilding as a pro. And he's not. I think he's a bodybuilder. Um, but you know, he, he just proves that in natural bodybuilding, it's not like the assisted realm where there's a, a, a fairly substantial size difference and there's weight and height limitations on the classic guys mm. that then means that the classic physique guys are inherently smaller than the men's open pros, you know? It's not to say that if Chris pushed it and did the open or whatever, he couldn't be competitive because he could. But there are differences quite clear between the, the two. And in natural bodybuilding, the difference is much, much narrower. So, yeah. I suppose with the ability to kind of dip in and out of categories, it does, like you said, make a hard job for judges. Mm. Because if someone's shredded to the gills, has really nice, like really nice insertions, like you said, has that classic X frame. Yeah. The scoring criteria between classic and normal bodybuilding like obviously while it is slightly different overall the like i think every like everyone's been at a show and you can nearly pick the overall out of a a category straight away so if you are that good you will probably win both categories anyway and i'm sure if you try on a pair of men's physique shorts and they like you you're probably going to win men's physique as well it's just like like while like there are distinctions between the three categories the the baseline of looking nice having good muscle quality good kind of like those genetic uh genetic things so you're you, you have the golden ticket or you don't yeah i think i think i think if you've got if you've got good shape if you've got good shape and good structure then you could do any class yeah honestly you could do any class i think the, the, because if you've got good shape and even you're like really muscular you're probably still going to be decent in men's physique because your your narrow waist will lend you to that class. But the, the issue is then if you've got okay shape, but you've got a lot of muscularity, for example, I'm not going to say he has okay shape because he has amazing shape, but for example, like Brian DaCosta, you know, he would look silly in a pair of men's physique trunks because he's so <laughs> big. 
um you know it's like 195 pounds the poses would just not look right um yeah. but he he has got decent shape uh you know uh, dirk is a fantastic example of someone who's definitely a bodybuilder because he's not classic and he's not men's physique but he yeah. is granite hard and in most poses he's got good shape but let's be honest in the men's physique shots he would not look good because his waist is a bit wide and his hip and his rib cage is a bit wide too so it's like rib cage and like hip dimension and like that side of things it's like gonna probably like the rib cage is often overlooked like the rib cage can yeah. make or break a physique if your rib cage is wide there's ugh, there's not a lot you can do i mean you can build more muscle but your rib cage is always going to be big you know so mm. like it, it kind of hurts you on a lot of poses and it even hurts you on the side poses um so it, it, it's like yeah but shape shape is so often overlooked and you know you, that's the that's the guy that you're going to be looking at when you say you can spot the overall it's like if you see someone that stood up there with just a, such a narrow waist and like wide shoulders and everything else flows with it it's like your your eyes are immediately drawn to that when you look at bodybuilding shows so on, on the point there of, sh of shape like this year with the WMBF worlds uh, when the middleweights are on the pro middleweights there's a guy called benjamin Huster, uh schuster if anybody in the in the audience wants to look him up but like when he walked onto the stage like everybody's just like how how is his like shoulders that wide and his waist is like that small and like he's a young lad as well and he's just literally built different and like i suppose that's the that's the thing with bodybuilding isn't it it's you can have amazing work ethic you could like be lifting really good weights in the gym but like shape like really dictates all because like that's what you're slabbing that muscle onto and like you can obviously improve the look with how you pose on stage but you know there will literally be pe people who just walk on stage and like they could be training like a, a wet minute and they're just <laughs> just their shape just wins the show and like that's like that's a really good case of it you know because like he's he's probably one of the youngest in that lineup but he was the best you know and yeah. even with the likes of like the ribcage stuff like that's that's definitely one thing i've like noticed from like looking at shows as well like even on my own ribcage my ribs don't like look shaped nice like if i pull a vacuum like it doesn't look like the the cylinder like the kind of half or semi-circle kind of shape you'll see with some guys on the, on the ribcage when they pull a vacuum and like even that is enough to say yeah maybe classic wouldn't be a kind of great area for like me to pursue for example so again it's like being able to be honest with what your build is going to look like and what classes or uh, what categories are going to like suit you the best is like kind of the one to pursue really aj would you consider maybe like hip width similar to that rib cage because i suppose when you do think of maybe like particularly front poses that like if someone does have that wider um wider hip proportion like it is obviously going to throw off that kind of flow of an x from the clavicular to kind of the the knee portion where you would be looking for that wider frame yeah yeah the, the hips the hips are a killer as well um i'd say rib, rib cage rib cage and and hips and and then clavicular width it's like if you if you have narrow clavicles a wide rib cage and wide hips you're gonna you're yeah. gonna have a rough time. It's just like <laughs> that's, that's, that's take a pair of it's just me being honest. You know, it's like I I always I always say this with clients as well because I've had it in situations where you know I get someone with a very very like you know fired up passionate mindset, but mm. I know for a fact that they're almost working themselves up to be disappointed. So I have to like level with them and be honest and just say, look, you know, this is a, like, I almost have to show them like call outs of a bodybuilding show and be like, look, this is bodybuilding. This is what you're signing up for. This is the genetics that you're going to meet. This is, this, mm -hmm. you know, let's work hard. Let's enjoy working hard and let's be passionate and present hard work. Yes. But, you know, filling yourself up with this passion to just win a show, like that's your only goal is win a show. And you've got this structure it's like that's that's not that's not going to end positively because i've seen it just happen <laughs> to a lot of people it sounds so cruel but i can't imagine it 
throats. <laughs> I can't imagine how it's, hard that would be. Like, like you, you have some ju- some junior <laughs> team, and then AJ has to sit them down and be like, "Look, man, I'm really <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'll stay coaching you. You're really nice, but <laughs> yeah, coach be kind. I know, but you do have to manage expectations. You're you're a hundred percent right. Like, like I coach a lot of like powerlifters, like like a shitload of teenagers, and like like you said there they have a tenacity and enthusiasm that like yeah, you just right. like i you can't like you, you hate the idea of raining on someone's parade but yeah. when you have the uh when you have some creator standing in front of you and they're going oh, i'm gonna i'm gonna squat that 400 kilos or i'm gonna whatever bench 200 you're like if you if you were that we'd know by now and that's the yeah, yeah, it that's is it, it is the cruelty it. like like and even with like a lot of the hypertrophy research, it does kind of say that like your start point is pretty important for uh for your your potential. That like, yeah. look, if you if if you if you were an outlier, we'd know we'd know in six weeks, three months, we'd know. And like that's the it it is the cruelty of like it 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 is a hard thing in coaching to manage to manage expectations but uh yeah i would have loved to have been a fly on the wall the first time you had that conversation with someone <laughs> oh dear because it is like, like it is hard it is yeah yeah well it's high level sport like i mean that guy could still get up and have the time of his life but like you said where if he's thinking i'm gonna win it's like you're he's setting himself up for the fall like like it's it's nearly irresponsible as a coach to say Oh no no you 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 you'll win all right yeah and to, to yeah. echo that back because then or like the, like you said at the start the person gets disheartened they hate the sport and like it was definitely a, an awareness for me like when I did that first show I was looking around the place and I was like I've big thick hips a big thick rib cage I've probably as wide at my shoulders as I am at my midsection and my hips so. Probably not. <laughs> Probably best not to spin, spin my wheels in this for the next ten or fifteen years. <laughs> That's another thing, though. Like, you know, it's like if if you if you if you genuinely love bodybuilding and you've not got the best structure, but you love the lifestyle, it's like cool. Keep mm. going. Like, keep going. Keep yeah. going. But yeah, you know, part of the reasons why I have these conversations is exactly that. Exactly that because I'm sure whatever you're doing right right now, you're super passionate about it, but you've also not hit your head against the wall chasing a bodybuilding goal for five ten years and in in in, th- in that time you could have been chasing something perhaps slightly different that you enjoy more and then you get more satisfaction out of and i've just seen it time and time again people do exactly that you know chase a bodybuilding goal for uh, an extremely long period of time almost feel like they're dragging themselves through the dirt only to oh, not yeah. get what they want and you know, end up breaking down even like friendships and relationships and things like that to, to chase this thing that the reality mm. is that the, the body's almost calling out to them to yeah. say, look, this is something that we shouldn't be doing. So mm. yeah. I do. I do think bodybuilding is nearly a sport of sunken costs for some where it's nearly like they don't know when to call it off. And I suppose that's particularly in the assisted side. Like, like, I mean, if someone's if someone's a natty bodybuilder all their lives, like, oh, geez, man, you look phenomenal for 50. Like, like that's the worst case scenario, like, really, or they maybe don't have a great relationship with food, but particularly in the assisted side, you, you do look at some some people and you're like, oh, man, please just fucking pull the plug on this. Like, like just, like, we like we want we want you to be in the gym in five years' time. Like, like please just, please just pack this in. Like, and it's not out of, like you said earlier, AJ, where it's like, there is obviously something in them where they feel like, oh, if I just did this, if I just did this, oh, mate, like if I just adjusted this a bit more. And maybe that's where where the coach does step in. And maybe you do, like, obviously, it, again, like like it, it maybe is a bit different in the assisted versus the, the natty side where maybe the coach do, would step in and say, maybe peel back, maybe maybe change we'll change the goal post here. But it does, um, like you said, where people can ruin, not ruin their lives, maybe that's a, uh, maybe a, a stretch, but they can, they could miss out on other opportunities in the pursuit of something that may never be on the cards for them. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely 100%. I, I, I agree. It's, 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 it's definitely a message that 
I, I wish a, a, a lot of people understood more. And it's not to not to be like a downer on it, but it's it's um it is 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 very true. And there's so many things that you can do. There's so many other things that you can chase uh, as opposed to ju- just competing. Though that is, you know, there, there's so many other options that involve training, nutrition, everything like that. But you know, not necessarily taking it all the way to the stage, which is a huge commitment if you wish to do that. Especially if you do it often, <laughs> you know, it's a huge, huge yeah. commitment. Like one w- one of the things it, with the whole like I want to win a show mentality that was like. If if you win a show but you don't look your best, are you happy that you won the show? Or if you win the show but there's like very little people in your class, are you happy that you won the show? Like it's not necessarily about like the winning of the show. It's the way I think about it is like, have you built or have you built a physique that's worthy of winning a show? Have you prepped to the level of a competitor who is worthy of winning a show? Like if you yeah. can have that as your kind of mindset, then like if you step on stage and regardless where you come you'd probably be pretty happy because like body, body building, bodybuilding is like different to powerlifting in the sense of like you have an idea where you stand with powerlifting. <laughs> like you can go into open powerlifting and see who's in your weight class and see like who the top 10 are. And as well, like over maybe, I don't know, two, between two to four weeks out, you kind of see the flight list of competitors that are going to be competing against. Because like bodybuilding, you find out like the day before or maybe like the morning of. And then like you look up their name on Instagram and they're like, oh my god didn't know that guy existed <laughs> you know he doesn't even he, he has like 300 followers or something like that and then you step on stage and you could have you could be the best that you've ever looked and then you come second but because he didn't win now you're like fuck this you know yeah and like yeah. yeah if all you care about is like the outcome which you know you know you get you get the, you get the like the pride and glory you get the plastic medal but like that's like the extent of it really um, and if that's all you care about, then it's it's gonna take away from your enjoyment of, of the sport because if there can only be one winner, like a show, right? And that might not necessarily be, be you, and by like statistically, it probably won't be. Yeah, I yeah. Think the, the mindset of like training to win, but being prepared to be beaten is is a good one to have because mm. you know if you, if you train to to win, you you have you have known that you've done everything in your power to yeah. to be the best on on the day and. That even involves having like a competitive mindset when it comes to like present presentation of your physique and you know whoever's standing next to you, you're confident in present presentation of your physique and it doesn't doesn't matter whether they look bigger than you backstage or whatever that doesn't doesn't change the game yeah. for you you know all of those things matter but then also you've just got to you know be prepared for you know the eventuality that even for example if it's a close decision and just the judges don't go your way on that day. It, it, it could have meant that on another day you could have won. So, you know, bodybuilding is a very interesting one on that front. And it's why that, um, you know, having the goal to just win isn't always the, the best goal to have, especially for people that are doing this for like the first time. You know, for yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's kind of like if you, if you embody the like behaviors of like a professional at a sport, like, while you might not necessarily in the context of bodybuilding you might not win a pro card in your first season like very few people do you might not win in your second but like if you keep at it and you keep doing shows like inevitably you, you might get there right you might get lucky enough to get that position like like eric Helms this year like he's he's done a number of podcasts yeah. but like this is his i think it's like 14th year competing like like actually bodybuilding and like only this year he won his pro card right but like that's n- that's not giving up you know and that's taking the kind of L's where you get them, but all the while still carrying yourself as a professional. And whether that comes out to you eating your meals every day, doing your fucking posing every day when you're on prep, uh, whatever that may be, you know, keep doing that. And like, eventually you'll probably get the reward you want, but it's not necessarily that the reward is the thing that you should ultimately strive for. It's like kind of living by those kind of values, living by those practices day to day. Yeah, Yeah, no, I think you're dead right. I think that's where like, bodybuilding gets really bad press because i think for an awful lot of people bodybuilding is an amazing additive to their lives like like more like again not all we're not making a rule here but a lot of bodybuilders you meet pretty adjusted people bodybuilding seems to uh give them really really nice structure um but for a lot of people it's uh health promoting behavior it's a real additive 
Um, but there is a like for for the likes of, uh, of Eric or uh, Alberto, even like when you talk to them about it, they really do love the the mastery, the craft, the uh, the the commitment to it. And I think when someone does like AJ said there earlier, where it's like you train to be competitive, like you you bring that energy, you bring that uh, enthusiasm to it. But it, it, there is an acceptance of like, okay, look, if I want to be good at this, I really need to love doing it. And I think like for new people that are new into powerlifting, new into the bodybuilding, like I coach again, like I was saying, a lot of teenagers and they're like, oh, I'm not a, I'm not a good junior, so I won't be a sub junior. So I'm not going to be a good powerlifter. I was like, no, man, it's like there's there are like how many juniors in bodybuilding and powerlifting do we see? They might win all around them as a junior, and they're gone a year later, or the same in powerlifting. That it's it there. There has to be a long, a, a really long commitment for most people to get good, or to at least get up to the higher levels within the sport. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask you in regards to like prepping prepping your competitors for the stage next year, and we've talked a lot, a lot about first timers, and inevitably but like a first timer you have a set amount of data that you've maybe got for what the year that you've been working with them so how do you decide like okay we don't have any information about you being absolutely shredded to the gills so we need to know where we're going to start a prep where we're going to end it and how fast we're going to take to get there so like what would be the kind of decision making that you kind of make around that process yeah, so I think with, with most people in that situation, I'll try and get them to give me information on when they were at their, their leanest. So whatever that looks like, I'll try and get a visual on it. And if I can then estimate, okay, right from there, maybe we needed to lose like 20, 25 pounds, we can then start to like plan out what the prep's going to look like and also understand whether we've actually got enough time to play with. Because we kind of, the way that I like to kind of map out preps for the most part is have ideally with a client a phase where we'll be pulling them down into a position in a pre-prep phase sort of a a shorter diet but more aggressive potentially towards that one to 1.5 percent of body weight loss per week pulling them down to a position where they don't have to lose ideally much more than 15 percent of their body weight in the entire contest prep period like that would be ideal but of course in most scenarios it doesn't end up happening ends up being for most people, their first preps, especially if you've not done it sort of like nailed on, it's probably going to end up being closer to like 20% of their actual stage weight inevitably that they're going to have to lose. Um, so let's say someone's 150 pounds on stage, they're probably going to end up losing like 30 to 40 pounds in their first contest prep to get there. Um, I always like to kind of, especially with first timers, like overestimate how much they have to lose. So um, I'll kind of give them a, a buffer and I'll think, okay, maybe you're going to be ready here, but I'll, I'll knock that five pounds down based off the fact that I, you really don't know what you're going to look like at that weight and then give them a timeline that allows us to get there um, in a sensible amount of, of time. Obviously, sometimes you do have to go to extremes that you don't want to have to go to to get people into shape. Um, you want to avoid that as much as you can. And that's why having a year and a off season with someone or at least six months would be ideal. But again, even with some of my athletes like that I've worked with before and then come back to me and I'm like, come back to me in this spot and they don't come back to me in that spot. And mm. <laughs> I know they can adhere and I know that they're in this spot because they just didn't do what I told them to do. So we still go ahead with the, with the prep, but I tell them, look, like this is the same prep that we did last time. It's the same longer diet than I wanted to do with you. And I told you to come to me at this weight and we're not at this weight. So... We just go through that same process of a slightly suboptimal prep on paper, but we still get to the finish line. Um, it just has to be a little bit different than some others. And then, you know, so like let's say working back from a, uh, an estimated stage weight, I'll probably, just to give listeners like a rough idea so you can think about it for yourself, I'll probably have, so let's say we have like a 20-week prep or a 25-week prep, I'll probably have, the first eight weeks or so, most people end up losing around about 1% of their body weight each week. And then for the rest, I'll, I'll ideally have between 05 and 0.75% of their body weight being lost. 
So essentially, the basics is you lose faster at the start and you lose slower at the end. That's all that you really need to know. Um, and about 1% is really the fastest you really want to lose, even at the, at the start of the prep. In a pre-prep phase, if you're really soft, you can lose a little bit more than that. You're probably not going to lose any muscle. You're probably going to be just fine. Um, but realistically, when you get into the actual prep itself and you're starting from a good spot, 1% is pretty much the fastest you want to move. And it's easy to say, like, okay, we'll just lose at 1%. Like, on paper, for some people, like that's actually quite challenging. Like, for a 200-pound start weight, that's losing £2 every week and not missing. And if you miss, you're behind. You know, like, 1% mm. is actually quite challenging to lose every single week for some people. Um, so, you know, it might sound like not very much, but it is. That's a good amount of body weight to be losing every week. Um, and then you did ask a question. I'm sure you'll probably ask it later, but whilst we're on the topic, so, like, breaks in between that over the course of the prep itself so i'm not a huge fan of planning them because you know some people you know like build a whole prep and then build in diet breaks blah -de blah diet breaks itself i think act more of a psychological uh benefit more than a physical um there are physical benefits of course of feeding up in terms of performance but i think largely you can retain or have very similar performance by just controlling the rate of loss rather than scheduling loads of diet breaks so i think if you control the rate of loss and you have a very smart setup with your volume you probably can retain performance just the same as you would if you had diet breaks in versus diet breaks out that's at least my belief from what i've experienced diet breaks definitely add a lot of benefit a little bit closer to the end of the prep if one fatigue has climbed quite significantly like diet fatigue because they definitely wash off a good amount of that um we'll get rid of a lot of that i don't like the term wash off because what are you washing off it just sounds like a fancy phrase um you're just getting rid of some of it um and then like by the end of it most people are actually really psychologically ready to then attack the next phase they're like oh i'm craving to diet again i'm ready i'm excited to diet again so there's psychological benefit I think they serve purpose a little bit later on also to start to understand what the peak is going to look like. So like carb tolerance, like how high can we push food? What, what does their physique look like after three days of eating up, four days of eating up, five days, whatever it may be. So that's how I like diet breaks, but it's, it's actually quite rare that you get to use them in a first time as prep, um, unless you just have a really, really long prep that, you know, you get a lot of time working with that individual or, you've worked with them for a lot of time in the off season and you know you might know where their lean weights are a little bit more than you know getting them for the last three months of their off season for example um refeed strategies i definitely like to use them i, I think that they're really helpful again psychologically uh i think having light at the end of the tunnel is a good thing um i also think that it kind of in some ways i do believe there is a for, for very metabolically adaptive individuals, I think it does help a little bit to keep a bit more momentum. Whereas, you know, when they just sit on the same calories linear again and again and again and again and again, you might hit more stalls. Whereas if you have like, let's say a 5-2 strategy where you're dieting for five, eating up for two, they seem to be a little bit more responsive off the back of doing some form of strategy like that. At least that's what I've noticed. Um... Again, not something that you might want to use every week. And the reason, the same reason why I'm not a fan of planning in the diet breaks is the what, same reason why I'm not a fan of every single week refeeding because you can use them also regulated off feedback that you get from the client. If they're breezing for a week and they're flying, there's really no reason to feed up, to be honest. Like, and if they look, you know, the fullness is being held where you want it, um, there's no reason to, to feed that individual up. Whereas if you're noticing a significant drop in fullness maybe a, a good drop in performance um you know they're, they're struggling you can feel that they're struggling they're actually willing to tell you that they are because a lot of my clients will not tell me that they're struggling they'll just tell me they're fine um and so you gotta try and work out whether they actually are or not so that's part of the coaching communication that helps uh you know build a, a better perception of your client um and then yeah you know if they feed them up for a couple of days they're into another good week of fat loss so that's typically how I like to use like diet breaks, refeed strategies. Um, and the refeeds always would be, you know, just for reference, they would be all just increased you know, calories from carbohydrates mostly, not like going out for a 
you know, a big off land meal or something like that. Something calculated. Yeah. And as regards mini cuts, AJ, what kind of percentage would you be looking at there in those? Maybe if you're, uh, if you do get someone like you said, they come to the, uh, they're in may- maybe the middle of their off season, they're a couple of kilos up. What would be your strategy there for getting those off? Sorry, what did you say with the percentage? I missed. It. I just missed the first, the first, the first part of the as question. Regards kind of, as regards kind of mini cuts, would you have oh. uh, similar percentages to what you'd use for preps? Yeah, so probably a little. Uh, I mean, if if so, let's say someone's in really like really bad shape. You know, like they're coming to you and they think that they've done the best off season ever, and they're you know, <laughs> really, 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 really soft. Um, is this the you, is this the same guy that wanted to win the show? <laughs> God, I think this guy would cancel his direct debit straight away, to be honest. Um, but yeah, no, yeah. Uh, I think with those people, it's like yeah, you can definitely take things a little faster. Um, yeah. I think again, it just depends on adherence level. But you know, if 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 you if you've got a lot to lose, just getting it off quick is really going to be helpful rather than just spending time losing at a really like slow rate of loss and dragging out like i've had this several times where you know people have just come to me too soft and also their diet adherence is just not great and you know what initially was mapped out to be a six to eight week mini cut i've actually stopped writing mini cut in their sheets because it's not a mini cut anymore it's like it's just you're just in a extended diet you're just dieting for 30 weeks because this is a mini cut that you can't adhere to. So, <laughs> you, you took know, the, we're, we're, took we're the, now you, just, you just, took going mini on, of just going on for a whole whole year of fat loss, pretty much. Um, but, you know, it's like, yeah, those those situations, if you can get it off quick. And I've had clients where, again, they come to me a little bit out of shape, um, a little bit away away from where, where they want them. And I'm like, look, I have to lock in now. This is going to be a bit rough. Calories are low. Mm-hmm. But once we get it done, we're done. And we can go into the next phase and it's just going to set us up so much better. And I've had clients that have just flown through that. Super, super good. And, you know, then they're actually feeling probably better for it as well in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. And, you know, you can get rate of losses probably 1.5%, maybe even 2% if, if you're really flying. But, um, yeah, you can definitely go a little higher than the 1%. 2%, 2% a week would be pretty rough, I'd say. It, it would be challenging, but trust me, there's some there's some people that definitely could lose that and not be in a, a position where they'd be getting flat anytime soon, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> or even yeah. hungry in some cases. Yeah, so, yeah. I think I, I think though that level of a uh, deficit though it does kind of set you up for prep being almost a little bit easier, you know, because like yes, your your calories get low during prep, but like relatively they are probably not going to get as low as they could get in like a mini cut, for example. And like the suck you probably feel during a mini cut can, all, can often be that little bit worse because you're coming from a place of like your food being really, really high, then getting pulled down drastically low. And uh, obviously, you know, you kind of do feel the effects of your fat loss going a little bit quicker um, versus towards the end yeah. of prep. You know, if you go from 150 grams of carbs to 100 grams of carbs, like it hurts a little bit the first day, but you hit that pretty quickly. And then you're just like, hmm. I, I'm happy with my with my low carb days and my plate of green beans and chicken. <laughs> During the prep, what kind of things are you keeping an eye on for performance? So performance was one of the with bodybuilding. Obviously, look, you're not going to maintain your strength levels throughout the entirety of a prep. But as as someone does get lean, or what kind of way are you modifying their their programming or maybe their exercise selection as the prep goes on? Sure. So I think straight out the gate everything probably stays very similar because you know as as much as the the deficit's coming in if we're losing at that sort of relatively steady pace out of the gate uh we're, we're gonna have similar recovery capacities you know no, like everything's not going to change the moment you start eating slightly less yeah. Yeah. however you're going to listen listen to the, the feedback each and every single week and then you start to see maybe okay i'm, I'm struggling towards the, the back end of this session you know maybe glycogen availability is having an effect and things like that or they're just generally a little bit tired um and you think okay right well maybe just pull pull the volume down just a little bit so that you know the session length as a whole just just drops off um and you you also might let's say for example you've you've had some things in the off season that you've been pushing in terms of potentially body parts that need to come up you start to kind of just drop those things off because you're not 
then going to be making more improvements. You're going to be focusing on just retention of, of that muscle. If you drop some of those things away, I think relatively quickly intensifiers would, would come away because, again, these are things that we use to create a novel stimulus and we're not really chasing novelty. We're chasing just doing the same sessions but holding on to numbers for the majority of the prep. So like a rest tours or a drop set or things like this that eventually would, would kind of just create unnecessary fatigue. They'd probably come out. And then, again, not straight away, but once we lose the first maybe 10 to 15 pounds of body weight, it's inevitable that the movements that are non-externally stabilized are going to start to become more difficult to retain. So unless we have a specific reason for doing so, for example, we have a hybrid athlete that's also looking to compete in powerlifting on the way down, we're going to probably be taking away those movements like a barbell back squat. Uh, so we're doing a bench press or even some dumbbell work with presses. It's just going to serve a better purpose to do all your dumbbell work that was for your presses on a smith or on a machine it's going to probably serve better purpose instead of back squatting to do a hack or a pendulum um or an leg press in some cases um so yeah it, it sounds kind of a little bit annoying and boring for some people and there are also there are also the people that will feed it into your brain that if you back squat the whole prep your legs will look way better than someone that's done a hack squat and I can guarantee you from doing both that it's it's not that deep and that both yeah. of those things are going to help you. And if you can back squat well the whole prep, congratulations, because it definitely takes, I'm going to tell you, it definitely takes a lot more minerals to back squat the whole prep when you've got lines on your ass compared to getting on a hack squat. Because again, I've done both. Yeah, I did a whole mm. prep back squatting until I got to the last last day of that prep and everything was in bits besides my quads probably at that point my hips knees you know everything All right. yeah. um yeah yeah my oh, whole yeah. back my spine um yeah. so yeah i mean it, you know you get to a point where even putting a bar on your back like genuinely hurts your spine because you yeah. got very little body fat there so um just just being protective basically of what's going to retain muscle and what's not going to get you hurt as well and what's also going to manage your like bloody nervous system because you know the amount of of sympathetic drive that you have to get going to like do anything hard in the gym is challenging but then also throw in a movement which is non-externally stabilized and you've got to fight the stabilization aspect of it and get yourself worked up for it it's like you walk out of that session you're like death warmed up and you know then that affects your ability to mobilize body fat and then you're not actually getting any leaner you're just getting really watery and fatigued and it's just hell on toast so you know basically doing the hard stuff yes but doing the hard stuff with the right tools is what mm. you need to do from a, a training standpoint and i suppose with a lot of the research that's coming out about the body's ability to retain muscle with pretty low stimulus relative to what it took to get there i suppose yes. there is probably a fair argument for like you said not massively dialing things down but at least kind of kind of going okay look we're over overall performance in the gym might have to be tailored back to facilitate a little bit better recovery uh maybe the the physique is it, and like i suppose like you said there like like there's small things small things that maybe people might disregard it's like i'm training really killing myself in the gym looking but i'm looking a bit a bit watery or maybe i'm not losing weight it's like well you're, you're just not covered yeah exactly yeah and, and uh, it, it, it's it's annoying sometimes to have to pull out some of the things that you, you maybe do really love and enjoy but yeah it, it's the click of a thing you can have those things back in but you can also just do them well you know rather than getting yeah. upset every session because you can't perform in the way that you previously did when you were 20, 30 pounds heavier. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I definitely think like being able to switch to actually bodybuilding when it's needed is like super important because like obviously you can have those lifts in your program that you really enjoy in your off season, the likes of like your deadlifts, your squats, but at a certain point in prep, like again, as you mentioned, like the, the stimulus to fatigue like just won't be or well trade off. But that's one thing I noticed when I was prepping, like I pretty much tried to maintain on my power lifts up until I couldn't last year and I prepped to think up until like a month out from my first show I continued back squatting and deadlifting 
But once I got to the shows, like between peak week to peak week, you know, I was trying to think of, well, how can I still, you know, stimulate my quads without necessarily, you know, during a week, like peak week, when you're meant to be dropping fatigue, like get that, but not necessarily, you know, absolutely waste my kind of body, my body's, uh, my body's energy resources, right? And like being able to switch to just doing leg press or just do like a machine chest press or, you know, do like a hamstring curl, like seat hamstring curl versus like deadlifting from the floor or something like that. Like there, there's small changes and like, while obviously initially you can be a little bit like kind of resistant to let go of them, like the, the prep is going to be over before, you know, realistically you can have them back in and you'll get back to like the strength levels that you were and it's not really going to make much of a difference in the grand scheme of things. Like, again, if you get more direct stimulus from using leg press than you did for your last few weeks of doing squats, like, is that not a better trade-off, you know? So it's uh, being able to, yeah, essentially kind of let go and, like, not be as pedantic about these things uh, towards the end of prep is super important. And that's another reason why you have a coach. <laughs> I suppose the it is the, the training why a lot of people probably do initially fall in love with the sport and, it, I suppose there is a maturity that will come with it as well. Like similarly in powerlifters where like people want to train hard all the time. It's like, oh, if you just maybe trained sufficiently hard or like AJ said, maybe just do it, do what you're doing really well rather than trying to trying to make yourself bleed on every on every uh, every set. I think a lot of people probably would nearly make more progress in the gym. If, you, ahead, if like, you're training like... Dor- Dorian, like in his off season, when you're in your final week of prep, you know you're probably probably doing ass ways. <laughs> yeah, it's probably um, nearly self harm at that stage more so than bodybuilding. <laughs> you're you're signing up for. Thank you very much for coming on, AJ. And uh, obviously, there's a lot of information there that I think a lot of people will get a lot of use from, especially as this is going to be like released like the next week or so. So, coming into the new year, so we'll have uh, some first timers, hopefully reach out to you to prep for 2025 rather than 2024. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I was just saying, if you have a w- wide rib cage, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you got, if you got tick all hips, maybe, maybe get on to, on to another coach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all, them, all them big bottom boys, they, AJ, AJ, don't want none of it, none of it. Um, yeah, AJ, uh, did you, did you want to plug at Sure. So, uh, yeah, in terms of the, uh, the sort of myself, just follow AJ Morris underscore on Instagram um, and you'll ha- sort of have all, all links, uh, everything there. I do have a uh, YouTube channel. Again, AJ Morris is just content that goes all the way back to like 2014, 2015 on there. Um, and then, yeah, of course, MBW, so naturalbodybuildingworldwide.com, which is a natural bodybuilding membership website, which has video content, uh, training videos, and then also just educational videos in the form of like courses that you can follow through and learn in like a, a structured fashion on, on different things, different topics. Um, I mean, obviously, I have just a, a forum area as well. So if you have questions that are specific to the world of natural bodybuilding, uh, myself and uh, the other athletes that we have on there can all assist and help out and you can log and share your journey on there as well. So, so definitely make sure to check out all of AJ's uh, content. Like what we just talked about for like the last hour, you can pretty much get like a lecture series of this on the National Bodybuilding Worldwide website, which is phenomenal, especially it's what, seven ninety nine a month or something like that. If you did enjoy this podcast, get onto that. Make sure to give us a rate and review uh, on the podcast platform we listen to. Share us on your Instagram stories and we will catch you in the next one.